All right, thanks for joining me for another episode of the Law Lounge. Uh, today we're covering a lot of the technical laws um, to do with the who, what, when, and where of rugby. Uh, so we'll crack right into it. Cool, so our resources that we take today, um, as always, the law book. So today we're covering five laws, the little numbers. So um, law one for the ground, law two for the ball, law three for the team, law four for players' clothing, and law five for time. Uh, there are a lot of uh, clarifications in law as well, particularly around the team. So you can find the links there to some of the uh, uh, links, mostly to do with uh, substitutions and scrums and uncontested scrums, um, but also some clarifications around clothing uh, and law application guidelines as well. The most recent set around uh, what happens during uh, uh, scrum and the forcing of, of uh, uncontested scrum. Uh, definitions help us out too, particularly today. We have a lot of definitions that will uh, guide us through. Um, our domestic safety law variations come into play a lot as well. And of course, uh, you can find all these resources on our Bay Penny Rugby website. We have our laws page, education page, and our intro to rugby refereeing is a great resource to get started. Cool, so we'll kick into it. So a few, a few de definitions which get used throughout a few of the different laws today. Uh, so just knowing when the ball is dead, uh, so that's when the referee blows a whistle to stop play or following an un unsuccessful conversion where there's no whistle. Uh, foul play, so anything that a player does within the playing enclosure um, that against, against the foul play laws, which we'll be covering on Thursday. Um, that's referred to a few times today. Match organiser is referred to a few times as well. So any um, body responsible for organising a match. Um, obviously at international level, that's World Rugby. Local level here, it's Bay Finney Rugby Union. Uh, and anywhere in between. Uh, red card, um, so red card shown to the player to indicate uh, they've been permanently excluded from the match. Uh, that one's fairly, fairly straightforward. Uh, sent off, same deal pretty much, player is shown a red card. Uh, if we talk about Sinbin, it's the designated area where a, someone sits to um, when they've been temporarily suspended or yellow carded. Temporarily suspended, uh, so yellow carded pretty much. So usually 10 minutes in a game of 15s um, and that time can vary depending on the length of the game. Uh, touch, so touch is the area alongside the field of play. It includes the touch lines and anything, anything beyond it. And lastly, yellow card, of course, is the same as being temporarily suspended. That's the card shown to the player and then that player is a bit of a spell in the sin bin. Cool, get into it. So law one, the ground. Uh, so quite a few definitions here, which are pretty key to helping us out. Um, and we'll show you the diagram shortly. So the ground is defined by the area shown in, in the diagram, which is on the next slide. The definition of the 22, so the, the 22 is the area between the goal line and the 22 middle line and between the touch lines. Uh, so it includes the 22 middle line, but not the goal line or the touch lines. So that's really important to define, particularly when um, talking about um, uh, you know, gaining ground for our kicks. Uh, dead ball line, so the, that's the line at either end of the field. It's not part of the playing area. Uh, the, field of, the field of play is defined as the area between the goal lines and the touch lines. So it doesn't include the end goal area, um, and it doesn't include those lines either. So this is just the area in which we play in. So this is, this, there's a lot of ramifications for where rucks and malls and tackles can take place. Uh, the goal line uh, is at either end of the field of play. It's not part of the field of play either. In goal is the area between the goal line and the dead ball line and between the touch and goal lines. Um, and it includes the goal line, but not the dead ball or touch and goal lines. So that's the in goal area. It, up until very recently as well, it also included the post padding, but that's since been removed uh, as a law amendment. Uh, the playing area definition. So the playing area is pretty much the, the field of play plus the in goal areas. Uh, the playing enclosure also refer, it refers to the space around the playing area. And the touch and goal uh, area is the area beyond the touch and goal lines alongside the end goal area. So here we can see the diagram that was referred to in, uh, in the previous definitions. Uh, it shows the ground with all the measurements. Um, so we'll just take you through the ground and what it needs to be like. So the, mix, the minimum, minimum and maximum dimensions are shown uh, on the diagram. So the ground needs to be, so between the goal lines need to be at minimum 94 meters and at maximum 100. The end goal areas have to be a minimum of six meters, but a max, they can be a maximum of 22 meters. Um, and so particularly some of the old days where 
some of the previous, you know, older games were played, you see those massive in goal areas. Um, and yeah, the in goal can be up to 22 meters, whereas particularly in, in Europe, you see quite a lot of uh, in goal areas that are quite short. Um, in terms of going across the field, so the across the field from touchline to touchline is 70 meters maximum. There needs to be at least 68, so not much wiggle room there. Um, and if any, and if there's any uh, changes to that, so we, where we take that size away from, um, in terms of length, we take it away from between the 10 and the 22 meter lines. So we shorten it up between there because the 22 has to always be 22 meters, and the 10 meters always has to be 10 meters. And uh, if we take it away from the width, then we can reduce it between the 15s. And the perimeter area, uh, which is the area around the outside, must be at least five meters wide. Cool. And this is this is a visual, visual representation of, of the definitions we looked at before. So you can see the field of play top left uh, shaded in green. Is, it doesn't include the end goal areas. Playing area includes the end goal areas. The playing enclosure is everything, including the perimeter. The perimeter is the area just around the outside, which has to be at least five meters. Um, the in goal, of the in goal areas, two in goals down each end. 22 is the green shaded bit. And then the scrum zone. So the scrum zone we haven't talked about yet, but it's the areas five meters in from each of the uh, touch lines and the try lines. That's where a scrum can be held. Scrums cannot be held anywhere outside of that zone. Well, so the playing surface and the lines. So the playing surface must be safe, it's gotta be grass sand, clay, snow, or artificial turf, and then the turf has to be approved by World Rugby. So we have different sort of lines, the, so the dead ball and touch and goal lines, the goal lines, the 22 meter lines, uh, halfway, the touch lines, and those are all solid. We have dash lines, now each dash is five meters in length, which uh, becomes quite handy, particularly as a referee. Uh, you can use those dash lines to help measure length in terms of you know, our players back. Uh, far enough, or are they on side, particularly if they need to be back five or ten meters at scrums or lineouts. Uh, so they are, we have those dash lines five meters from and parallel to each touch line, 15 meters in from and parallel to each touch line, 10 meters from and parallel to each side of halfway, five meters from each goal line. Um, and we also have one more line uh, which doesn't actually appear on most rugby grounds, but um, particularly at um, first class rugby, it, you'll see it. It is a half a meter long line that intersects the center of the halfway line, which is, denotes the middle of the halfway, which is where kickoffs are meant to be taken from. In club rugby, you often see a big pile of dirt and then the kickoff taken from wherever they can. Goalposts. So our goalposts need to be uh, 5.6 meters between the uprights and need to be three meters to the top edge of the bar. And the height of the actual goalpost itself needs only be a minimum of 3.4 meters. So you don't even need to be that high. Um, and the distance from the external edge of the post padding um, from the goal line can, is no more than 0.3 meters. Flag posts. So 14 flag posts on the field, uh, each with a minimum height of 1.2 meters. Uh, so we have uh, flag posts at the intersections of the touch and goal lines and the goal lines. So that's the, the corner post, as they often refer to. Uh, they, we have them at the intersection of the touch and goal lines and the dead ball lines. And then we have them also in line with the 22 and a half way as well on each side of the pitch. Now, these ones are not put on the, on the touch line. They are put two meters outside the touch lines um, within the playing enclosure. And if there's anything to do with the ground that the, the team don't like, they must uh, let the referee know ahead of the game. Um, and a referee cannot start a match unless the ground is, is considered to be safe. Right, on to the ball. So the ball, as you can see here, is the minimum and maximum dimensions of the ball. Now, this is a full-size rugby ball. Um, you up to about 30 centimetres in length, um, about 600 millimetres around, and then... Uh, about 750 millimetres uh, around in terms of point to point. Now the characteristics of the ball, uh, so it's oval, it's, it's made of four panels, um, weighs around about uh, mid 400s in terms of grams, uh, has to be made of leather or, or a synthetic material, which, is not, which most are, and it can be treated to make it water resistant. Um, so the air pressure, so if you're looking at um, PSI, it's around about 10 PSI. And 
you can you can use smaller balls for matches between young players and of course you'll see a size four size three ball uh, etc used in junior rugby uh, and you can have spare balls available during a match onto the team so the team is probably the one that causes um, the most confusion in terms of uh the substitutions and when where players can't be so we'll dive right into it so the definition of the team is a group of players who start the match plus any replacements the definition of a blood injury is uncontrolled active bleeding not just blood uh the definition of a captain is a player nominated by a team to lead the team consult with the ref and select options relating to referee decisions um the definition of replacement any player who replaces a teammate because of injury or for tactical reasons and the definition of an uncontested scrum. Uh, so scrum, so the feeding team gain, uh, wins the ball without contest, and neither team can push. Um, now, you often, particularly in New Zealand, you often hear about golden oldie scrums. Golden oldie scrums are usually quite different as well because uh, they have a whole other set of um, made up of golden oldies rules attached to them. So it's really important, particularly in rugby, when we're not referring golden oldies, that we refer to them as uncontested scrums. And all scrum laws apply apart from the fact that teams cannot push and the, and the team winning gains position. Okay, so playing numbers, no more than 15 in the playing area during play. Of course, this is for a 15s game. Uh, so match organizer can authorize games to be played with fewer than 15 teams, uh, players in each team. Um, and you'll see variations of this come into force over the next couple of seasons, particularly with um, grades that are not premier grade or top grade for an age division, uh, particularly with the game on protocols. So you'll see games being able to start with at least 10 players, which uh, as we build into a season, we'll put out more information about. Uh, now this is an important one. So if there are more, if a team has more players than they're allowed to have on the field, um, then they can make a complaint about that to the referee. Uh, and the referee tells the captain to reduce their numbers accordingly. Um, now, unfortunately, it doesn't change anything. So if a team had 16 players on the field and they go and score a try, and then the other team noticed that they had 16 players on the field when they scored that try, that's tough luck. The try still stands. Um, but of course, that that's noticed after the try is scored and before the conversion, um, then the team just has to reduce back to 15. They take the conversion, um, and then the other team starts with a penalty on halfway. So, yeah. It doesn't change anything in terms of score. It's just tough luck. Um, but again, it needs to be uh, managed carefully with silo managers, referees, et cetera. And that's where setting up your field and making sure you have sub tech zones and everything ahead of time can uh, work really well in your favor. Replacements. So um, the match organizer denotes how many replacements can be nominated, up to eight. Um, typically we see seven replacements at club rugby level. Um, at community rugby level and eight is usually for first class in high performance rugby. Um, replacements only made when the ball is dead. We've defined when the ball's dead earlier and only with the permission of the referee or another appropriate match official. So you could it could be the referee themselves, it could be the touch judge or uh, sorry, the assistant referee or a sideline manager who gives permission at that point. Because that's delegated to them by the referee. Uh, so if a player rejoins or a replacement joins a match, there's no permission from a referee or a match official, um, then that player's guilty of misconduct if the referee thinks that they did so to gain an advantage. Um, typically you'll see, if they think they did it intentionally, typically you'll see a penalty and a yellow card issued for that. Number of front rowers. So, uh, so a replacement of a front row forward must come from a suitably trained, experienced player. Um, so prior to the match, teams need to advise the referee who their front rowers are and what position they play. The referees should be coming along to each team um, when, they, when they check in and do their checks. And then at that time, that's when they ask about the front rowers. Uh, it's important that the referee does know what position each front row player plays, um, as this comes in handy later in the match, particularly if there's injuries or issues that then cause the game to go to uncontested scrums, which we'll talk about now. So you see this table, this table differs 
actually differs from the law book. You'll notice that this is a, it says at the bottom, it's a DS or DSLV law, so it's a domestic safety law variation. So this is quite different in New Zealand to world rugby law. World rugby law um, says that you need to have at least four up until, not up to 19 and then more after that. In New Zealand, you only need to have three front row forwards in your squad for any squad size up to 20. So you must have three front row forwards in your squad if you any, any squad size up to 20. It's all the way from 10 up to 20. Um, so obviously you don't need to have a replacement on the bench, um, but it's useful to have one. Once you have a squad size of 21, you, you must have four. You can either have a prop or a hooker. Once you have a squad size of 22, which is the most community rugby, you must have five. So it means you have three on the field uh, and then two replacements. Of course, those replacements could be anyone. They, they could actually be players that are already on the field. You could have a lock, for example, who's trained to play in the front row. So if you might have your three front rowers starting in the starting lock, that's four, that's four and you might have one on the bench, that's five. So in 22, you have to have a prop and a hooker um, to replace. And then for anything with squad size of 23, such as first class rugby, uh, you must have six players uh, who can play. And you've got to have a, a replacement loose head, tight head, and hooker uh, in those instances. So uncontested scrums. So the, what leads us to un uncontested scrums if scrums uh, if, uh, team cannot field a suitably trained front row? or if the referee orders it. Now the referee has the power as a DSLV law within New Zealand. Uh, if they believe that the scrum is unsafe, they can order uncontested scrums. Um, usually they'll ask first to see if there's any other players that can play in those positions that are suitably trained. It's not the referee's responsibility to, to determine if those are players are suitably trained or not. That's up to the, the team and the, the coach and the, the captain and the, ref the players themselves. Um, but if a referee feels that the scrums are unsafe, they must go to uncontested scrums, and that's, that's the safety law to keep the scrums safe in New Zealand. Um, so uncontested scrums, if they result from a sending off a yellow card or injury, um, they must be played with eight players per side, and that's at any level. Uh, that's pretty much most of the reasons that you'd probably have an uncontested scrum. Um, so if a front row player has been uh, sent off or yellow carded, um, or if they've been sent from the field to get a mouth guard, uh, if there are no more front row players available um, from that team, then uncontested scrums can, will also be ordered as well. And only when there's no replacement front rowers available um, can any other player play in the front row. So if we have to go to uncontested scrums and there's a another front rower who's not maybe not trained in the position let's say they're a hooker they're not tr but we needed a, a prop um if they're on the bench then and it's uncontested scrums anyway they must come on and play on the front row um we can't you can't then put a you can't then bring another loose forward or a or a back on and put them in the front row if you've got another front rower um on the bench and available to be, to play so Front rowers must replace front rowers, even if we have to go to uncontested scrums because they're not trained in that position. But if there's no one, no front rowers left available to go in the front row, then only that's only when other players can come on to the go in that place. So nominating a scrum replacement. Um, so if a front row player has been sent off or has to go get a mouth guard. Um, once you get to the next scrum, then referee asks the captain, uh, hey, do you have someone who's suitably trained to play in the front row in this position? Uh, if they don't, then the captain chooses any player to leave the field to play, and they can um, get a replacement on who is suitably trained um, to play in that front row. Um, so that's where you often see, you know, they might send off a number eight or a, or a flanker, um, or even a back, depending on what their strategy is, and then the front row comes on. Um, so they can do that, so the captain can do that immediately prior to the next scrum. Um, or if they've tried another player in the front row, but it's not working out, then they can do it after that as well. So permanent replacement. So permanent replacement, is, so a player can be replaced if they're injured. An injured player, once they're replaced, they cannot um, return um, to the game at all. They're deemed to be injured if um, they've 
uh, deemed injured by a medically trained person, and that happens to be if there's a match organiser that's given permission for a medically trained person to be there, or if the referee decides with or without medical advice. So they might, um, so the referee or another match official, um, might be an injury, physio could come on, or um, if, they, if there's some consultation and they believe that there's, uh, it's inadvisable for the players to continue, they're deemed to be injured, uh, the player leaves and they, that player cannot come back on. Uh, also, the referee can also order an injured player to leave the playing area to be, to be checked out as well. Now, if a player goes off um, as a precaution and then subsequently they, it's deemed that they can't carry on, so they go off as a, maybe a tactical substitution and then they since develop, you know, they can't go back on, then they, need, they must advise the referee that there's now a permanent replacement um, and that that player can't continue. The referee or a subs controller or assistant referee or someone else delegated to that duty as well. There's another DSLV law here, so concussion and blue card. Um, so if the referee believes a player has been concussed or suspects a player has been concussed, the referee must order that player to leave the playing area and that player cannot return to play in that match. Um, so in grains of which blue card concussion initiatives apply, um, player, referee must show the player a blue card. Doesn't have to be brandished about, it could just be subtle. Um, the player shown the blue card may not return to play in any future match without meeting the requirements of graduated return to play. Now, this is uh, particular, I'll speak from Bay of Pliny, um, for example, um, the grades in which blue card concussion initiatives apply. So it's all of our senior grades, all of our senior grade referees have uh, undergone blue card training. They do it each year online as well as um, biannual, triannual um, practical sessions as well with a, with a registered doctor um, who specialises in concussion. Um, so all of our senior grades are those grades. However, any, any referee who then has been trained as a blue card referee, uh, if they're referring lower grades, so any junior or secondary school grades, then they can also in those grades issue a blue card uh, and then the blue card concussion protocols apply then as well. Uh, all of the blue card concussion protocols can be found uh, on our Bad Party Rugby website. Um, the referee's responsibility after the game is that they make a short report uh, and then it's the managers and players' responsibility to ensure they follow the return to play requirements. Blood injury. So if a player has a blood injury, they must leave the field of play. They can be replaced. Uh, it's the temporary replacement and they can return as soon as the bleeding has been controlled with the permission of the referee. Uh, so the player is not available to return to the field of play within 15 minutes. This is not 15 minutes of game time. This is 15 minutes of actual time. Uh, so if it's 25 past 10 um, and they leave the field, um, they must be able, available to return to play by 10.40, irrespective of, of uh, how, how much game time has actually gone since then. Um, if they're not available, then the, um, the replacement becomes permanent as an injury replacement. Temporary replacements. So temporary replacements, they can be temporary replaced as well or replaced if they're injured. Um, so if a temporary replacement comes on, they can then be themselves temporarily replaced. Um, or if they get injured, they can, an injury, uh, a replacement can take place even if all replacements have been used. Uh, if a temporary replacement gets sent off, so let's say number 15 comes on for number five, number five just has a blood injury. Uh, then, so number 16 comes on for number five. Uh, then number 16 gets uh, yellow carded. Um, then Number five can't, if the number five gets their bleeding control, they can't come back on the field uh, until number 16's yellow card has expired. Um, the only reason they can come back onto the field is if it would avoid uncontested scrums. Uh, and, but then they have to make another substitution to do that. So it's a technical little roundabout there of, of uh, players coming and going. Um, but long story short is, yeah, they the must have a certain amount of players on the field and a temporary replacement sort of is like a stand-in for another for another player who is off getting sorted out. Um, and as mentioned 
previously the temporary replacement becomes permanent if the time elapses, so 15 minutes. Um, so let's say it happens five minutes before half time, five minutes goes through, oh, so have it, sorry, 10 minutes before half time. Um, they're required to be back on the field um, at the start of the second half if the time elapses during half time. And if they're not, then they're a temporary permanent replacement. Lastly, tactical replacements. So tactical replacements, um, they, can re they can return to play only when replacing any of the following people. So they can re replace an injured front rower. And of course, that's to avoid uncontested scrums. Uh, they can replace a player with blood injury as a, as a temporary replacement. They can replace a player with a head injury. That's to do with blue card or concussion. Uh, they can replace any player who's just been injured as a result of foul play. Uh, so that has to have been uh, verified so um, by the match officials. The referee has to have seen, called it as foul play, and then the injury has to has has to have resulted from that. Now the player might be able to feel like they can play on for a bit, and if they do, that's fine. Um, but then if they subsequently find that they can't play on um, and they were injured through foul play, then they and they and they leave, then a technically replaced player can come on for them, um, and they can come on as a nominated replacement to avoid uncontested scrums. Uh, so that's for senior rugby. There is an under-19 variation, so everything below under-19s. A tactical replacement can come on for anyone who is injured. So if you have an injury in under-19s or and below, uh, then a tactically replaced player can come back on the field uh, to replace that player. half grain rule, uh, New Zealand, another New Zealand domestic safety law. Uh, so applies to all levels of domestic rugby um, below secondary schools, first 15s. Um, and so it also includes all representative rugby at under 16 level and below as well. Uh, so squad sizes are usually 22 um, and all players in that squad must play a minimum of half game each match. Uh, this is not a referee um, enforced rule, this is a, a manager and coach uh, responsibility uh, and uh, any sanctions or non adherence usually is taken up between managers uh, and with the match organiser. Okay, law four, players' clothing. All right, so the players, definition of players' clothing, so anything which a player wears um, to be legal that has to conform to World Rugby Regulation 12. We'll talk a little bit about, about that shortly. Uh, the definition of a jersey is a shirt worn on the upper half of the body and not attached to the shorts or underwear. The definition of shorts are trousers that start at the waist, end above the knees, have an elasticated waistband or drawstring, and are not attached to the jersey or underwear. And the definition of underwear is an undergarment that covers the body from the waist, uh, having short or no legs, ending above the knees, and is worn next to the skin or underclothing, and is not attached to the jersey or shorts. Now, the definition of underwear is quite critical, particularly when talking about skins, and we'll talk about that shortly. So World Rugby Regulation 12, uh, this is the regulation which governs all of the clothing and safety aspects for clothing. Um, everything must comply within it. Um, so to view Regulation 12, it's a fairly lengthy document. Uh, the link is there, we're not going to go through it today, but it shows all the specifications for things like boots and headgear, um, specifications for anything that, for, the, for, for compressible materials, um, padding, shoulder pads, things like that. So what can you wear on the rugby field? Right, so player must wear a jersey, shorts and underwear, socks and boots. Um, that's the minimum. Um, so the sleeve of the jersey itself um, must extend halfway from the shoulder point to the elbow, at least. So it can extend full length if they would like. Um, addition, some additional items are permitted and these include uh, washable supports made of elasticated or compressible materials. Note that these must fit underneath or within the confines of the shorts, jersey, socks. Um, so long sleeve uh, supports are, are fine because they fit within the allowable confines of the jersey. Long, uh, long legged uh, Washable supports are not fine because they don't fit within the confines of underwear or shorts. So leg long skins are not allowed. 
Uh, shin guards can be worn. Again, all these must comply to Regulation 12. Uh, ankle supports can also be worn. They can't extend higher than one third of the length of the shin. Uh, you can wear mitts, so fingerless gloves, essentially. Uh, you can wear shoulder pads, uh, headgear, um, bandages, dressings, thin tape, and other similar material. And goggles, which uh, Ali Savia um, showcased recently, uh, a couple of years ago. And studs, so uh, on the bottom of your boots, um, it, this can include mold rubber um, on the soles of the boots as well. Uh, women can also wear chest pads. Uh, they, women can also wear cotton blend long tights um, and they also head scarves as well for religious reasons, so long as they're worn in a way that don't cause danger. Mouth guards, this is another domestic safety law variation. Uh, New Zealand requires all players um, to wear mouth guards in an approved way. Um, the only reason that they uh, would not be able to wear a mouth guard is if they have a medical certificate and that they, they'll be exempt from it. Now the sanctions, this is heavily sanctioned. Um, so referees are required pre-match to check for mouth guards. So to check boots, mouth guards, front rows. Um, the reason they check before the game about a mouth guard is as a reminder to make sure that players have their mouth guards so they've been notified uh, so that if the if they're then caught not wearing the mouth guard in, in an approved manner um, that is misconduct is also intentionally infringing the law of the game so they're issued with a yellow card for the first player um, the referee then has to speak to the captain of that team set and advise that any further players not wearing a mouth guard will be issued a red card so that's when the, ref, the captain has a chance to speak to their players. The player Yola Carter can return to the field of play um, after their um, time's up in the bin, um, but only if they're wearing a mouth guard. If, they, if they're unable to return wearing a mouth guard, they can be replaced and it's deemed a permanent replacement. Uh, and if more players from the same team are observed not wearing a mouth guard in the same game, those players are issued a red card um, as the team has been repeatedly committing the same offence. Uh, and any player issued with a red card for a mouth card um, receives an automatic one game suspension as well. So again, it's it's a lot of teams have got the message in, in the last couple of years. Um, this was a law that came in about two years ago. Um, probably had a flurry of cards to start with. It, the team's getting used to it. However, it's been a long time since uh, since I've seen uh, had to issue a card just personally. Uh, and it's good to see teams and players um, taking the message seriously. Uh, what can't be worn on the rugby field? So players can't wear anything that's contaminated by blood, anything sharp or abrasive, buck buckles, clips, rings, hinges, zippers, screws, bolts, rigid material, or, um, not otherwise permitted under this law. So basically anything that's gonna cause damage or danger to anyone else. Uh, Jewellery can't be worn. Uh, gloves cannot be worn, but bits can. Uh, shorts with padding sewn into them. So effectively like goalkeeping shorts cannot be worn either. Um, and anything that's um, normally permitted, but if the referee deems it's likely to cause injury, then they can't wear that either. So there is some subjectivity there that allows the referee to um, advise a player not to wear something. Uh, communication devices also cannot be worn either. The referee's role in all of this. So the referee has the power to um, decide if a player's clothing is legal or illegal or dangerous. Um, so if the referee asks them to remove that item, uh, they cannot take part in the match until the item is removed or rendered harmless. So if a match official tells a player prior to the match that a banned item has been worn, uh, and if the rep player then is found to be wearing an item, so let's say they're wearing some jewellery, um, referee tells them to take it off prior to the match, but the player still wears it and they, they're caught, um, the player must be sent off uh, for misconduct and a penalty awarded. Um, and also in terms of um, leaving the playing area, so you cannot leave the playing area uh, to change items of clothing unless they are bloodstained. Um, probably some famous examples of that, uh, Sonny Bill Williams, John Lomu, um, both in international matches having to change shorts and shirts and things like that, so because they've been ripped, they can't leave the playing area to, to make those changes. Lastly, time. So time, the uh, definition of actual time, uh, is continuous elapsed time, so playing time. Half time is the interval between two halves of the game, and playing time is the actual time, excluding time loss or stoppages.
match length. So match lasts no longer than 80 minutes, split to two halves, not more than 40 minutes plus lost time each. Um, so match organizers may authorize extra time. If there's a knockout competition or semis or finals or things like that, you can have extra time at a, at a rugby match. Um, note above also that plus time lost. Uh, so any, any time lost or stoppages, that time loss is added on to that half, not at the end of the game. Under 19 variation, so matches cannot last any longer than 70 minutes. So um, 35 minutes each half plus time lost and no extra time is allowed in under 19 games for any reason. Uh, small box variations. Uh, so match, matches last no longer than the following. So if under 12s, under 13s, you have two 30 minute halves. Um, eight, under eights through to under 11s, two 25 minute halves. And under six, under sevens, you have two 20 minute halves. Those are New Zealand domestic statutory variations. So half time and time keeping time. So the half time consists of an interval not exceeding 15 minutes. Um, so it's decided by the match organizer. So 15 minutes is usually the upper end of it and usually has to do with um, first class matches which involve television uh, to do with uh, commercial um, responsibilities. Um, Teams and match officials, they can lead the playing closure during this time. Um, most community rugby games, you'll see an interval of about five minutes. And that's usually stipulated by the match organizer in the competition rules. Uh, match organizer can decide to, to reduce the length of a match. So they can make it whatever length they like. They can reduce it and they cannot make it longer. Um, and the match organizer does not decide, um, but both teams agree on the length of a match. Um, they they can. So if both teams come to a referee and say, hey, we just want to play two 30 minute halves today, um, then the game can get underway. Um, and if they cannot agree, then the referee decides. So, yeah. Uh, so the referee keeps time, but they can delegate that duty. So um, it you know, might be an assistant referee, it could be a, a timekeeper on the sideline. Um, then, um, if there's no official timekeeper or, and the referee's in doubt, if they have doubt about the time, uh, then they can consult with their assistant referees. Um, and then if they can consult with anyone else as well to find out what the time is, but only if the assistant referees can't help. Stopping time. So a referee may stop play and allow time for the following things. So they can allow time for an injury for up to a minute. Um, however, there's discretion here as well. So if they deem that there's a serious injury that need more time, then the referee has the discretion to allow that more time. Uh, they can stop time to consult with other officials. Um, once the ball's already dead, uh, the referee can stop, they can blow his whistle and stop time for the following as well. So any replacements, um, replacing or repairing players' clothing, and that's the clothing deemed legal that we previously talked about uh, for retying a boot lace uh, or retrieving the ball. So all of those instances, time can be stopped as well. Uh, ending a half. Um, so half ends, the ball becomes dead. So, so when the ball becomes dead, after the time has expired, unless the following situations occur. So if a scrum or a line out or, or a, a restart kick um, is awarded before time's expired, uh, then that scrum liner or restart kick must be played but it must be completed successfully um, and the ball returned to open play so it include like if a scrum collapses uh if there's a lineup that's not straight um restart kick it doesn't go 10 meters or goes out in the full then ball then that hasn't been completed successfully uh the ball hasn't returned to open play and therefore uh, the sanction must be applied for whatever infringement occurred at, the, at that scrum line out or restart kick. Um, if the referee awards a free kick or a penalty, again, uh, the half cannot end. Um, and if a penalty is kicked directly into touch without being, uh, without first being tapped or without the ball uh, touching another player, then uh, again, the line out can be um, played as well. Uh, so if a try has been scored as well before time before the half ends, um, then the conversion uh, must be taken as well. On the note of a conversion attempt, uh, so a team scoring a try may attempt a conversion or they can actually decline the conversion as well, particularly if they haven't got a lot of time left before the end of a half. Uh, so if they're deciding to decline the conversion, 
um, they must relay the message no kick um, to the referee. If they say no kick before time expires, then we must have a restart, a restart kick at halfway. Um, that lets you decide that to either attempt or decline the conversion before time elapses. Um, and if the conversion is attempted, time is taken from the strike on the ball. So the second, the, at the moment that the kicker strikes the ball with their foot, that's, uh, if that's before time elapses, then we must have a restart kick. And special circumstances. Um, so there's the following one minute breaks um, can be taken in play. Mid, um, about midway, these should be taken about midway through a half, um, about after a score or when the ball is dead near the halfway line, so such as a line out or a scrum. Um, and the time taken will be added on to the end of each half. So these special circumstances are particularly um, hot weather conditions. Um, and then the referee can allow for water breaks uh, or a small and small breaks level rugby. And the referee can allow a replacement break, a replacement break about halfway through the half. Um, and the referee also has the power to end or suspend the match at any time if they believe that it would be unsafe to continue. Not something that we like to see, but it is something that does happen from time to time. Cool, thanks for joining me today in the Little Lounge. Uh, we'll finish off on Thursday with our talk about the um, about foul play, which will be a big one. Uh, so join me then. If you have any questions, pop them through. Um, look forward to seeing you. Thanks.